This is the first episode in a new series we're doing at IBM Developer, exploring high-performance computing. And to kick off this journey, we have Dr. Anthony Shellam, Director of the Sim Center at University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, and Dr. Abi Arab Shahi, Research Professor. So they're using high-performance computing to fight COVID-19 by simulating lung functionality. Welcome to the IBM Developer Podcast. Thank you. Good morning. So that was a, a very short intro I gave. Uh, maybe we could just take a moment and you both could uh, give a little more comprehensive introduction to yourselves and to what you're doing at the Sim Center. Great. Uh, my name is Anthony Shellam. Thank you for having us on your podcast. And we look forward to telling you a little bit about ourselves and what we're doing to fight COVID-19 through modeling and simulation. I'm a professor in computer science at the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga, and I work as the director of Sim Center, which is about modeling and simulation and high performance computing. And the story today is really about Abby, who'll speak about all his great research. Good morning. My name is Abby Arabshahi. I'm a research professor at the UTC Sim Center. My background is uh, computational fluid dynamics. For the last 30 years, been modeling, uh, simulating, and code development in area of the incompressible and compressible flow. And I have an extensive uh, background in simulation of the long function. My research goes back to 1992 with Dr. Dan Olson from University of Toledo Medical School. Dr. Olson and I start simulating the bronchial tubes uh, from 1992. He is interesting enough, he's not only the pulmonary and critical care in medical doctor, he has a PhD in mechanical engineering, and I could understand his language very well because he was speaking uh, engineering. Interesting. And just to give our listeners a little context uh, to understand when you say simulating bronchial tubes and, and what's going on at the Sim Center, um, some folks may not even be familiar with what high performance computing is. So could you just give a context of what is the Sim Center and, and, and how you work there? Sure. The Sim Center was created in 2002 as a place to do uh, high end computing in order to be able to explore the boundaries of what's possible in simulation, especially with regard to field problems problems like fluid flows of air, water, uh, complex systems that involve, let's say, vehicles, submarines, airplanes, boats, even trucks driving down the freeway to figure out how much friction they produce. So high-performance computing, clusters of computers and supercomputers, big memory, big numbers of floating-point operations are crucial. But to go with that, you need the right algorithms and the right approach to use those computers. So it's a merger of several different areas of knowledge computer science, mechanical engineering, aeronautical engineering, and uh, numerical methods. So, so now this, it's giving me the, the sort of foundation uh, to, to understand like how you're in a place to actually like be already working on something that's related to the COVID uh, crisis we're experiencing. Well, Abby, I think you should give the long answer, but I'll give you the short answer. The answer is Abby's dedicated the last 28 years of his career to figuring out lung function with his MD colleagues. And now seeing this emergency, this pandemic arise, we see, hey, we've got something real here, and he should put uh, his attention toward specifically growing, improving, and refining what he's already learned with his colleagues to actually provide a solution down the road if everything works out right. As Dr. Tony said, you know, for the last many years of my life, I was working on the simulation, numerical simulation and modeling of the lung function, which means that we use the equation and solve it on the computer to predict the airflow, structure of the airflow and characteristic of airflow in the lung tubes. This uh, lung has about 23 to 24 verification. Is so many tubes in. When the, you get the CT scan, there are so many tubes. It's not visible with the uh, with the eye, and we get the CT scan from the uh, patient, and we use that CT scan as a structure of the lung in that patient, and breathe it. 
uh, do the grid generation and solve our PDE equations. And then uh, we, the solution will go back to the doctor and they give a detailed information about the structure and characteristics of the flow inside of the tube, the long tubes. This is a short answer to maybe a long, uh, many years of my uh, uh, experience. So, so what I'm hearing is that the research you've done it, being used in context today means that this will help uh, diagnose and treat the lung and damage or the, the disease from COVID. Is that? That is correct. And also we cannot treat the patient, as you know, but we can give a detailed information to the physician what is going on in the uh, patient lung. And then they can use the course of the treatment if it is a drug delivery, if it is uh, uh, using to what's, how much air should go in, where the long tube are blocked, or the air does not get to the tube to exchange the oxygen or the CO2, you know, the air pocket is collapsed. We can give those information, which is uh, very important. And is, it is very important to remember, we can give a time-dependent solution and the flow characteristic and the structure of the flow in the human lung in a set of CT scan, which is a one snap. Much cheaper to do this simulation and doing the detailed information than the experimental uh, model, because experimental model of, uh, is very expensive to model the human lung, and, uh, and one other thing, every human lung has a different characteristic. We are not the same. We can rapidly get the information from the CT scan and I mean, simulate patient-specific lung. So I have, I have so many thoughts and questions. First, one comment, which I think is, you know, could be really inspiring, especially to folks who aren't in the medical industry, uh, maybe you're an engineer out there, and to see that there, there's ways of contributing to the that aren't maybe, it's not directly frontline, but it's, it's so interesting how, you know, the science and technology, the engineering, the computation can really provide the tools that, that could make the frontline responders in healthcare have be that much more effective. But my, my next question for you is, uh, what inspired you in the beginning to go down this path? I, I was doing a little cyber stalking and I saw that you've got, you know, underwater autonomous robots and fluid dynamics and all, all kinds of interesting paths you could have gone down. But what sort of took you down this path? Uh, 1992, I uh, was introduced to Dr. Dan Olson from University of Toledo Medical School. And he has a problem to, under, uh, to solve. It was a one... Uh, verification. If I can show you, that's a very small, this is the, can you see? Yes. We did this uh, just one verification. Of course, it was a challenging problem at that time. Just uh, what he was, Dr. Dan Olson, he is a physician, engineer, and biology. He has a PhD, in biology, mechanical engineering, and subspecialty in pulmonary critical care. And of course, he has another title, DIS, DIC, Diploma of the Empirical College from UK. And he said his problem was to get the detailed information at one verification, because for the breeding or drug delivery, that was a very crucial how the flow behaves when once you get to the one verification because the angle of the verification is very critical and the the curvature of the verification is very critical and that was the the point of my interest in that area and of course we have had a long relationship and he has one of the amazing information. He, he has been in this business for the last 48 years, Dr. Olson. 
and he has done a lot of experimental, but experimental, what he said, he cannot get the detailed information. He can get information at different cross section, but where, for example, the flow is recirculating. If you have a particle in the one verification and the flow has a recirculation in one spot, majority of your particle would attach to the wall of the lung tube and stay there and ultimately it damaged your lung instead of helping you. And so when you were first starting, uh, as you had mentioned, and you said it was, it was challenging, was it what were the biggest challenges? Was it computational? Was it algorithmic? Was it like, what were those challenges that? The challenges was the, of course, uh, for the, in, in the field of the CFT, we should be able to uh, discretize the geometry to a small cubic to be able to solve our PDE at each small cubic. At that time, a grid generation was a challenging and is not anymore, but the computer power is, was challenging. We did not have enough computer resource to solve, for example, 10 million grid points at that time. Uh, that 1988, I did a simulation on the over close to 300,000 grid points on Cray-1, the biggest computer in the world. And that was it. I couldn't push it further. But with the new computer, uh, would, uh, our code is escapable now. We can push it to millions and million grid points. And, and when I said point, uh, because if you discretize your geometry in a smaller piece, you can have more and detail information at every point, it wouldn't smear out. You know, it's like a resolution. If you have a higher resolution, you get the better picture. I'm sorry I interrupted. I'm trying to, I'm being on my best behavior, I promise. But uh, what I wanted to say is that Abby is combining several different things to make the path from 1992 to today happen. It's a growth in computing, for example, large scale clusters like our IBM Power9 cluster that we have, have, we have here at UTC is a, is a platform for doing scalable computing. And then we're hoping to go out to much larger versions such as the Oak Ridge National Laboratory Summit cluster, which is a thousand times bigger than the IBM cluster we have here at UTC. So there's a technology piece running a scalable computational fluid dynamics code. There's the modeling piece that he's described working with Dr. Olson back to 1992 starting from one bifurcation, now there's 24 levels, and CT scans have advanced. But the CT scans that are available now and even are published uh, about COVID-19 for certain patients don't go as far as what Abby's algorithm and modeling can do. So CT scans have advanced, computers have advanced, clusters have advanced, their algorithmic knowledge of how to do computational fluids has advanced, but their modeling goes beyond the resolution in some aspects than the data that the CT scan provides. So there's a predictive, or in some sense, a deeper capability. All those things together comprise the solution that Abby's working on. So I'm kind of getting a timeline in my mind now. I'm seeing right, this research being done in the, the early 90s, and I'm sure there was other types of things that were needing the computation. And then a decade later, you have things like the Sim Center come into existence because you had this, these needs and people trying to solve these problems. Is, is this sort of the arc that's, that's happening? Yes, I would say that's absolutely correct. The Sim Center specifically was created here at UTC to do this cutting edge modeling and simulation where all things have to come together in balance so that you have the right computing, but algorithms and modeling together are necessary because raw computing power is not enough if you don't have the right algorithm that produces the correct answers at different resolutions in a timely fashion with enough accuracy, but also with enough precision. So you actually get something that uh, produces actionable information once you run the simulation. It's about the ideas and the, and the details, not the numbers. It's the insights that's produced from the simulation that's important. So that's really what SimCenter is about, that interdisciplinary conflation of those different aspects. And that happens at many great laboratories and research places around the US and worldwide. We're specifically good at these complex geometry and complex physics 
that Abby's talking about with regard to lung function. How can folks keep up with what you're doing or are there any sort of like public facing or calls to action or what, what should we let our listeners know uh, to sort of uh, keep up with what you're working on um, or if there's other sort of, if you have any maybe even advice like, hey, if you're interested in high performance computing or if you want to solve hard, if you have hard problems that you're interested in, here's a path. Like, so to, to, that's a choose your own question there. So what I would say is, uh, first of all, our whole university, like all the major universities in the United States, are activated to help solve the COVID-19 problem areas of their competency capability. We found a few of those here, and Abby's front and center for our SEM center is the COVID-19 research that, as we're talking about, may help with lung function simulation. But we're working on hard problems in simulation and modeling. We're focused on the things that are potentially like this and able to reach our community, our state, our region. And we know there are hundreds of other great universities doing likewise, so we don't want to overstate our case. We, we, we're doing cool things, and we have our natural customers and friends and people who can come to us for help on modeling and simulation. But we'd even look in, you know, the Chattanooga community is ready to draw for help in certain areas. And things like understanding home health conditions are things we're working on with one company and understanding how to build sensors with them, understanding how to do all sorts of things that we hope will complement lung function simulation we're talking about today. So I, I would say that Sim Center is looking to help people who want to solve simulation problems if they already have an idea. But we, you know, uh, we know that hundreds of other universities also are really good at doing that. So we don't say everyone shouldn't come to us. Everyone should go to their local university that has a big cluster and smart computational scientists like the ones we have, like Abby. And if they have ideas of how to improve the world and solve COVID-19 in some way, that's a good good goal. So I would say a call to action is find your local computational scientists and engineers and their computers if you have an idea or a, uh, for a product or service or so forth that could help COVID-19 or a, a cool simulation. If you're a physician and you have a research question to ask about COVID-19, maybe it's not about lung function, but something else. That's also a great time to engage with a university like ours. But as I said, there are hundreds. We're not trying to overstate our case. We're, we have hundreds and hundreds of university colleagues that also have sim center-like places. They're all trying to do their best to improve the world and you know, address a piece of the pandemic problem if we possibly can. That makes Dr. Abby, you have any thoughts on that? I think Dr. Shalom covered everything. I have a couple of questions in the press. There's been a lot of news about uh, intubation may actually harm some patients, which I find interesting. And then there's some um, stories where doctors are turning people on their chest, uh, which seems to run counter to uh, intuition, but the thinking is that somehow the heart lays on one of the lungs. So it seems like there is a lot of airway uh, questions going on with COVID. Are yes. you, you guys caught wind of any of that? Are you looking at any of that? Well I, I can uh, say this much. Um, I, the last time I talked to Dr. Olson, um, and he, uh, I asked him about the research we are planning to do, especially in this area. And he was interested in, uh, is, and he told me, he said, Abby, we are doing the clinical uh, experiment right now. Uh, uh, we are doing intubation and delivering drug from the lower because once you send the drug through your lung, I mean your mouth, you have a different uh, jet under the throat. And he said we are planning an into uh, uh, forcing the drug to get to the those small tube faster. Wow. Yes. There so, he is right now very busy with the clinical trial. So, sure. Linton, can I just say this? So, it's clear what's the, if you look at the complete feedback chain from the beginning to the end, so you have a patient, they're presenting with some, what's at least, let's say, 90% COVID. They do the CT scan or 3D CT scan, comes to our software, grid generation happens, simulation happens, feedback happens. But the feedback loop is what we're trying to speed up in this research now so that it can be uh, patient relevant, you know, while they're in the hospital. Wow improve their outcomes so there's a feedback loop in it's not going to happen months later that they're going to get this data it's going to be days or hours later we're trying to go to the period where that response time is good and you can actually do with the ct scanner uh you could actually do what ifs you could actually 
to have a series of scans or in positions, or you could ask those questions. If that turns out from their clinical experiments to be relevant, to understand exactly what you should do on a personalized medicine basis. So um, if you're gonna run one simulation with more computing power, you can write five simulations. So if one patient produces five CT scans, five simulations come and then down the road later, of course, we figure out how to use those together. But imagine they're just, you know, have one that, with patient in different positions, or as you're saying, Abby, that the uh, clinicians and experimentalists are doing their, uh, their tests and their trials. Um, that could also uh, be part of the analysis. Later, of course, we're looking to create predictive capability once we have golden data. This project is not yet about the machine learning and prediction. This is about the actual personalized medicine. Right. Yeah, hey, Tony, is there some kind of, you've developed the algorithm, the CT scan is passed to a device and your algorithm is running as an inference or something on an iPad? What it's not doing is not, it's, Terry, we're not at the inference level yet. So in the future, so if you think about the whole chain, you take the CT scan, we get the CT scan, a grid generation step happens, which is think of that as data preparation. The simulation happens, then all the what if questions of how the airflow works in that, those lungs can go back to the physician. To, uh, and what we don't provide is the medical interpretation of that. That's going to be part of the fact that we have uh, clinicians and colleagues who are MDs and pulmonology and experts that turn that information back into actionable uh, medical uh, decision making, right? So later, when we have a lot of those feedbacks and they're de-identified, and we understand what the patient presented with, what the simulation showed, what they did in terms of helping the patient, what their outcome was, we create a golden data set together. The second yeah. stage of this, out a couple of years now, when we're not in the pandemic emergency, but maybe when we're in a, you know, in an abated state and we have more time, then we're going to go into the machine learning business where we are doing inference, where there you have a bunch of these. But we're not just looking at static pictures and doing machine learning and inference off of static CT pictures. We're doing inference off of dynamic simulations about lung function and what that means for a patient. And then in the future, of course, there's a machine learning piece once there's actually golden data. Yeah, golden I, I, could con I could conceive where you could have a doctor send a image to your cloud HPC and it simulate and give back his report. That's exactly what's supposed to happen. And our, one of our metrics is how fast we can do that. Right. One of our metrics of using scalable computing, and I'm glad you mentioned that because it didn't maybe come out in the discussion so far. How fast can we do that? And the answer is that's a challenge. Scalable computing like our IBM cluster is a piece of that. How fast can we grid generate? How fast can we do the simulation? And remember, we're, our simulation technology that Abby's developed with his colleagues and students over the years goes beyond the resolution of the CT scan in some aspects. And if you think of all those bifurcations that he mentioned, if there's 24 levels, it's not a fractal because fractals go forever. But if you think about 24 levels and you can't get to all the 24 levels through the CT scans resolution, but he can go beyond that. He can't get all the way yet, but they're going beyond that. So they actually have already what is called a predictive capability. The next stage after that, a couple of years from now, we'll be doing machine learning on, over on the top of that. Not only will you get the answer and then you have to ask your expert doctors to tell you what to do with it, you could in the future get a product or service which says, okay, we ran the simulation and here's your choices of what to do with this information. But that's not what we're offering today. We're offering the ability to do the simulation and turn it around faster. And then experts in the field will tell you what to do with the outcome of that. Yeah, yeah. Like a radiologist. Sounds, sounds fantastic. And one more thing to mention is uh, doing the CFT computational fluid dynamics for the different age group. It is very important to realize the long of infant, child, and adult have a different uh, airflow characteristic and structure. We have seen uh, child have a COVID-19 uh, and they lost their life too. And this disease also damaged the lung for a long uh, time. And this is important because we can simulate the lung of the infant and child and adult. It's more patient specific. And uh, that information would be very important to the doctors. And so we have this head start essentially. So we're looking at this research and saying we really need to accelerate it literally on better, faster computers clusters and big uh, memory systems and uh, intellectually because 
it's now become a, a, a prime area. The MDs that Abby talks to are have their heads down. Thank you both for taking the time to chat today. It's been a great conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you.